This is Mission Control Houston. Flight controllers here continuing a contingency operation, uh, securing information and data. The last communications uh, with the Space Shuttle Columbia were at 8 a.m. Central Time as it uh, was flying 200,000 feet above Central Texas en route to the Kennedy Space Center for a landing. No communications have been received uh, with the spacecraft since. No tracking data of objects of any kind reported uh, by the Merritt Island tracking site and its C-band radar uh, when used to sweep the sky. Flight Director Leroy Kane has declared a contingency. Flight controllers are securing all information and uh, data and notes. No tracking uh, reported again of Columbia since about 8 a.m. Central Time as it was descending toward Florida, toward the Kennedy Space Center above Central Texas. Uh, let's get, let's got, get Kyle Herring back on the line. Kyle Herring is public affairs officer for NASA in Houston. Uh, Kyle, what can you tell us? Uh, nothing new, Miles, that I can report to you um, at this point. You know, still uh, maintaining the same posture that we were in just moments ago. So. Uh, uh, there's really nothing new at this point that I can pass on to you. All right. Uh, is it, w give us a sense, Kyle, uh, with your familiarity of this, as a, as a shuttle comes in for reentry, uh, the sorts of stresses. As we look at this tape one more time from our affiliate WFAA, streaking across uh, Dallas, you see what looks like a looks like a streaking comet, a meteor, and um, then all of a sudden, right at that point, I don't know if you saw it, right as it hit that went uh, behind that pole, multiple targets there, multiple streaks. Give us a sense of the kind of stress it would be enduring at that point, Kyle, going about 14,000 miles an hour or so. Well, um, uh, just based on my experience um, with a shuttle reentry, or usually somewhere around 250, 300,000 feet in altitude at that point, so you're back in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that reentry into the atmosphere really occurs about 400,000 feet, and that's typically out over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, then the shuttle basically it's high speed reentry. Uh, at that point, you're probably um, going somewhere around six times, seven times the speed of sound, maybe. Um, and there's a series of high speed uh, bank turns that are made by the computers to slow the vehicle down, All basically right. put the underside Let of the orbiter into the direction of travel to slow it down. Kyle, watch this tape with me. WFAA gave this to us. And look, right at that point, significant difference right there don't you agree oh definitely i mean it's uh it's definitely something that uh, uh occurred that we obviously at this point don't know what that is no. um that that caused this and then we're talking um about stuff that we have here um uh exclusively as we watch this uh, very distinct and uh, do you recall seeing the uh the mirror reentry call it's very reminiscent of that yes it's it's uh it's very similar to what would occur with uh, a, a targeted reentry of something that was uh, uh, like a progress vehicle that we send away from the station to, to burn up in the atmosphere, uh, mirrors reentry, sky labs, and anything like that, yes. All right, let's talk for a moment about uh, the contingencies which uh, the crew trains for ad nauseum in uh, Houston, which are, is bailout. Uh, what would be a scenario if something was going wrong at this point? What, what are the options for the crew for getting out if they need to? Well, uh, I'm afraid, Miles, that there is not really an option at this altitude. Um, the, the, the bailout procedures that are uh, in place for a shuttle, either during after a, 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 a engine problem on launch or, or uh, on reentry, are bailout procedures that would uh, take place or be uh, in effect uh, below about um, 20, 30 to 20 to 30,000 feet or so, um, so much much lower than than what you're seeing here. And we were you saying we're talking 200,000 feet at least there, uh, about six times the speed of sound. But what we're also talking about here, uh, Kyle, and when you look at uh, all the s forces and stresses on a space shuttle from launch all the way to landing. You know, we talk about max Q on liftoff when the, the maximum dynamic pressure on the on the shuttle. When is the when is the when does it encounter the most stress? Uh, launch, landing. Is this the period right here that we're seeing this tape? 
Well, launch is, uh, launch is probably uh, among the most stressful during that max-Q period because that's when there's the, the most aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle the, uh, in that altitude range uh, on the way uphill. Uh, typically, there's not a, a max-Q, if you will, on the way down. Um, there are stresses on the order of about uh, maybe two Gs or so when you're making the big, wide, sweeping turn approaching the runway. But at this point, uh, there aren't any stresses in terms of G-forces that you're really feeling because you're still pretty high up in the upper reaches of the atmosphere. So uh, it's not very thick, if you will, at that, at that altitude. All right. Let's, uh, we should tell you, Kyle, that while you were talking, received, uh, we're receiving some calls from uh, viewers. Uh, Palestine, Texas is the dateline. Uh, we're about 100 miles south of Dallas, I'm told, and uh, there are reports there of uh, a loud impact. Uh, let's leave that at that for just a moment. Kyle, if you could stand by. Uh, Phil Chen, just could you describe, the, you're right there at the, the shuttle landing facility. Describe the scene for me, please. I guess we've lost Phil Chen. Um, I should point out the crew, uh, the commander, Rick Husband, uh, the pilot, William Willie McCool, Mission Specialist 1, David Brown, Mission Specialist 2, Kalpana Chala, Michael Anderson, Mission Specialist 3, Laurel B. Clark, Mission Specialist 4, and the payload specialist, the first Israeli ever to fly in space on this 16-day mission, Ilan Ramon, at the tail end of what was a, a relatively flawless mission, uh, scientific mission, 16 days in orbit. Uh, what we're seeing here is very ominous indeed. These are uh, pictures which um, tell the story. That is clearly uh, the shuttle breaking up as it passes south of Texas, Dallas, Texas, near Palestine as it was coming in. Uh, communication was lost about 15 minutes prior to its anticipated landing at the Kennedy Space Center at 9.16 a.m. Eastern uh, local time. Uh, Kyle Herring, uh, search and rescue forces in motion yet? Can you confirm that? I, we've lost Kyle Herring. We can only presume that uh, those same calls that we are getting here are being received uh, at, uh, with um, the authorities. And uh, we're joined by a, a veteran space shuttle astronaut, a man who spent uh, several months on the space station Mir, a man who has experience before and after the Challenger disaster with NASA and the shuttle. Norm Thagard, good to have you with us. Thanks, Miles. Good to talk with you. Norm, can you see these pictures? Are you watching CNN? Well, I could bring it up, but I'm up, in fact, upstairs where I don't have a TV. If All we right. get a break, I can go to the TV. Well, Norm, as you well know, because you were with me that night, it's uh, practically a carbon copy of the picture we saw from the South Pacific when the space shuttle Mir came down. Multiple targets, multiple trails behind those targets. Where does that leave uh, the, the experts now, the engineers? What do they do? It almost certainly, I would think, Miles, means that the shuttle broke up. It is an electronically controlled vehicle, and if it, uh, for some reason, uh, loses control at those speeds, it's, uh, it's going to be a bad situation. Le yeah, let's back up uh, and talk about what could cause a space shuttle to break up at this juncture in its flight. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about how it's hydraulically controlled. We know what hydraulics are, obviously, but the shuttle doesn't have any operative engines as it comes in, so they fire up what are called auxiliary power units run on hydrazine, which power those hydraulics. And those are kind of, um, well, those machines are something you have to, you have to really uh, be careful about, right, uh, Norm? They uh, run at very high speeds, I think something like 80,000 RPM, and it is possible for, I guess, one to fly apart. However, there are three of them, and uh, you can certainly operate with the loss of one. And some of the rockets are used right down to almost the last, just as the shuttle starts to go subsonic. So some of the steering rockets or attitude rockets continue to fire uh, even down close to ground. Okay, so those steering rockets, how much, uh, would they be, they would be used at this juncture then? So the, we're talking about the, the rockets that are typically used uh, on orbit to maneuver the shuttle. Uh, they would be used at, in the higher altitudes where there's less air uh, passing over the aerodynamic surfaces of the shuttle, correct? That's correct, and as the shuttle gets lower and lower, I think various of those rockets start to be deselected, and then finally, uh, before the shuttle or right around the time it goes subsonic, none of the rockets are being used anymore. I see.